Georgia Virtue presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. Welcome to episode 204. Coming up this week, we have the Rona Republican. A sheriff gets the Miranda for giving a pat down. Oh, no. Smokey becomes a bandit. In our weekly legislative updates, I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my partner in this endeavor, writer, journalist, owner of the Georgia, Georgia Virtue, and dog mom, Jessica Salaji. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm fine. I read your um, your introduction, and I read it wrong. And so I was just as surprised as the sheriff getting the Miranda for giving a pat down <laughs> as everyone else. <laughs> so um, That's just great. That's just great. These opinions are Dave's. <laughs> And not necessarily those of myself or the georgiavirtue.com. I'll just go ahead and clarify that. <laughs> Throw that one out there. Yeah. Look, that's the extent of my writing ability right there. Uh-huh. See spot run. <laughs> and sexual innuendos about <laughs> alleged sexual battery. <laughs> oh, I, I am the innuendo master. I know. I, know. I can make any conversation uncomfortable. It's true. Just, just ask anyone I've ever met. <laughs> Just listen to the last, I don't know, 150 shows. 50 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> You're pretty I'm, immune to it by this point. I am. Some stuff I don't even realize that's like out of <laughs> inappropriate or something. And then someone else is like, wow, I can't believe you guys went there. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> oops. Yeah. That's just Dave. <laughs> well, we've got a triple dose of WTF. This week. Mm-hmm. What a week. What a week in uh, news. It really is. You know, some weeks we struggle to find material and other weeks it's like, wow. Talk faster. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we have Representative David Clark. Uh, he lashed out at GOP legislative leaders Thursday after he was denied access to the Georgia House floor following a positive COVID test. This is the epitome of not knowing when to um, pick your battles. Like, I think, I mean, I know we talked about it on the show when he, he's the same lawmaker who last year or perhaps, gosh, maybe it might have even been the summer of 2020 when he announced that, um, you know, he he was against the the bi-week or the twice weekly testing of COVID um, for of legislators during this session because at that time we had a testing shortage and he thought it was a waste and they were wearing masks and blah, 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 and social distancing. And and I think a lot of us understood that, like, even if you didn't agree, you could understand why throwing multiple tests down the drain literally each week when the the math doesn't add up, like how that seemed ridiculous when there was a testing shortage. This I don't know who can be like, yeah, buddy, you go. <laughs> like, yeah, he uh, is part of the uh, Freedom Caucus. Uh, he attempt. He was the leader in the attempt of attempted coup of David Ralston. And he wasn't wrong. Uh, no, he wasn't wrong there. But he, since then, he's kind of going off the rails here. Look, you pe- you tested positive. The CDC. Uh, recommends five days if you've been vaccinated, and he says he's been vaccinated. Uh, he says he's tested negative now twice. But if you if you work for any corporation in this country, they all have very similar standards. Except if you're if you're a healthcare worker, if you're a healthcare worker, you test positive, you're asymptomatic, you just go to work. Apparently, uh, but uh, almost every co- corporation in this in this country has the same standard. If you're if you have close exposure five days, Connie's been de- dealing with this with with trying to keep her branch staffed. It's, it's really hard when you have a, a family of of six people, and it makes its way around the family. So every time somebody else tests positive, that's another five days that person's out. It's a huge pain. But you know, the well, liability. Well, not only that, it's not just COVID though. I mean, like if you if you're sick, if you test for something that is transmissible. If, even if you're pissed about getting it and you don't want to deal with it, just don't 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 make a stink about it. I guess like just deal with it. It sucks. Yeah, so, sorry, buddy. 
But he said it, what did he say? Like, what were his words? He was like, is a low blow or a new low or something? Like, because they wouldn't let him on the house floor. Dude, you're sick. Not just that, this is the low blow. This is what you're going to say is a low blow. Uh, after everything that we can look back and, and, and on Ralston, this is the low blow. The fact that you have to go home until your quarantine is up. That's the low blow. I mean, come on, man. You're, you, when you when you use words like that, they cease to have meaning. But we have, and not to like harp on this this story, but we have talked about how you know they have lawmakers in different rooms of the Capitol and everything. Like at this point, we're two years into this. the The legislature should have had something um, in place so that our lawmakers could vote from home um, if they had to quarantine or from their you know their capital. Um, residents Their that office. they might have, or yeah, or whatever the case may be. I mean, they should. We should have something in place. We are two years into this. There, there's no excuse because if it, if there was like Congress where there it's year round, I think it might be a little bit different. But when when it is such a short legislative session and it's imperative that districts have representation, like vote remotely. Yeah, you, you can certainly do your committee hearings remotely. Mm-hmm. We know that. The whichever site they they decide to use with a Zoom or Google Hangout or anything else, I'm sure they could they could spend a lot of money getting a private server to do it, and the whatever votes they put in obviously need to be secured. But yeah, I had this I had the same questions. Why is there not an area to quarantine for for legislators that are that are hot that they can continue to vote and continue to uh, watch what's happening from the well, even address. From uh from your your quarantine location as if you were coming from the well, on I mean, it's almost yeah. like we don't have the technology to put somebody on a big screen in front of a bunch of people, almost like I don't know a movie. Yeah, I, I with all the COVID funding and federal money and all the stuff that's been expended, and you know, I, I think that would have been much more. Uh, it would have been at least a decent use of it. I don't I don't support the doling out of those dollars, but. At least do it for something that makes sense because, but, it's, but he, it's a he's not saying a that. Screen. Yeah, yeah but, it's a projector on a screen. It's, or just a, a flat screen that you can get from Walmart for, uh, for 500 bucks that, that you, that you can put on a cart. Just so, hell, like movie day at school when they wheel the TV and the VCR in. So I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, obviously I think there should be an accommodation made to make sure that the, People of his district are represented, but you do not get to go in there and get the representatives of, of every other person in the state sick, knowing that you've come up hot. You, you shouldn't want to, if you're sick with anything, you shouldn't want to get other people sick. Like, Right. If you got the damn flu, go, don't come to work. Keep it to yourself. It's just, so anyway. Yeah. yeah. It's just bad. It's just poor form. The grope heard round the world. Oh. Arrest warrants were taken out Wednesday night for a Georgia sheriff. Blackley, Blackley. Blackley. Blackley County Sheriff Christopher Cootie is accused of groping a prominent Atlanta area judge while the Georgia Sheriff's Association was holding its winter meetings at a Cobb County hotel. <laughs> I love this story. You do? I do. Why? Look. If, if you're going to get handsy, don't do it with a lawyer and sure as hell not with a judge. I agree. I So when I saw the headline, it was obviously that Cobb police had taken out the warrants and the warrants weren't released um, on Wednesday night. They didn't come out until Thursday morning, which really irritated me because sexual battery is is groping. It's like intentionally placing your hand on you know an intimate part which are the hee hees and the hoo ha's and all of that the hee hees and the hoo ha's huh? yes but i don't have the definition in front of me so i don't want to speculate which but he did put his layer that's what it is is that you put your hand on this the guy the runner with the news anchor when he smacked her butt that was sexual battery um and First of all, I hate the charge because it sounds way worse than it is. I'm not saying that it's not bad and I'm not saying that it's not inappropriate, but sexual battery sounds like something of the echelon of um, well, we, child we need, molestation. We need, 
Yeah, we need a a different charge. First of all, a smack on the ass is not sexual battery. Well, it's just I, not. I know, and uh, we've we've but belabored it's, it's, that, but, but yeah, it's much different from grabbing breasts. It, it does it. the The law does say uh, touching the buttocks or genitals of any person or the breasts consent. of a woman. Yeah, and that, and that's that's the definition. But I so, think that the term is inflammatory. So when you say that there's arrest warrants taken out for sexual battery and and the Cobb County Police Department did this BS thing where they said that they weren't going to take any questions and they weren't going to conduct any media interviews. And I, if I were a betting person, I would assume that's because it's a sheriff and he's in law enforcement and they in some circles and in some ways protect their own and they didn't want to make it worse. But I think that it made it way worse because all the headlines that are out there that got the first lead on it didn't have any explanation. Now, do I think that, um, like there's some people who are going to be just, just as disgusted as him placing his hand supposedly on a judge's breast or any other part as they would if, you know, he forced himself on her in an elevator. But I think they're very different things. And I think it was reckless what the, the sheriff's office or the Cobb County Police Department did in, in releasing it the way they did. And they took out the warrants on, I think, the 28th and they didn't release any information until the second and then they didn't release the actual warrant until the third. Like, okay, why don't you just control your own narrative there? And and again, we don't have any of the details for the ongoing investigation. Why are you issuing a warrant if the investigation is, is still ongoing? You need to have all the facts before you get a warrant for arrest. Well, and it's not like it poses the immediate threat. The act is done. Right. And I don't know what else you're going to compile. He's either going to talk to you or not. Right. And I I doubt doubt he'll talk to him. If anybody knows to shut up and call your lawyer, it's going to be someone who's been in law enforcement for 40 years. I laughed out loud, though, when um, I saw the statement. And it's probably going to sound terrible that I laugh, but... The sheriff's office put out a statement on Thursday saying, um, you know, some canned statement, but they said that Sheriff Cootie is outside of the state of Georgia on a church sponsored mission trip that had been scheduled for nearly a year. That's probably true. Um, but wow. It's true, but he sure did church up fast. Yeah, he did. And, and also, I mean, it it might be in the best interest if you just come home and handle it. You're yeah. a sheriff. Look, according to the warrant, Cody did place his hand on the victim's body parts without the victim's consent. There's there's got to be some context here. I mean, is now look, it could be that he's that he's in the bar. This is after the the conference all day in the bar, getting drunk, and goes and and cups her butt. I I don't, but we don't know. We don't know if they were in a in a in an elevator kissing, and he tried to slide into second base and got called out. We don't know. That that's that's what makes this so much worse. Is we think of the worst case scenario where he's going up her shirt or go going down her pants, and it could be that this prominent judge is over the top, or uh, they thought it was intentional and it wasn't. Look. <clears throat> There are things that happen. You know, you go in for a hug and and you're aiming for the small of the back and you go a little too low and go, whoops, and move your hand up. There's there there are accidents that happen. Uh, even like watching Family Feud uh, back when they could actually touch each other. He, uh, Steve put his arm around a guy and the guy puts his arm around Steve's waist and he says, hey, could you move your hand up a little bit? Because it happens. So w- we don't know. But yeah, he would be better served to get back have his have his attorney make a statement saying uh, that they regret the misunderstanding, but this is what happened or something. But yeah, li- leaving it dangling out there is not a good look. Making the GBI come down there to go get him not a good look. Are th- is the GBI going to come get him? I don't know how it works. I mean, I really don't because Cobb County. the The irony is that the um, Cobb County. Police have jurisdiction in Cobb County, and 
the sheriff is a constitutional officer and can has jurisdiction over the entire state. But 11 Alive released a story on Thursday as well, um, with which tells me they knew this story was coming because they had his personnel file from Post and everything else, um, which whatever, you know. I guess that's what it's what happens when you're like real media. But um, they put out this article on his post records, and it said that he was terminated by the Georgia State Patrol in 2007, where he'd been for 20 years. And a case summary attached to his file details allegations of improper conduct in at least two instances, um, though the dates make it unclear whether he was employed by GSP or the Bleckley County Sheriff's Office at the time that it happened. But here's here's where it uh, really just the file among there's so there's an incident with his son where there was like some alleged violence in front of his son and daughter against another individual. I don't really understand that incident, so I'm not going to go into it. But the other one is where his ex spouse filed a criminal complaint against him for allowing his 12 year old allowing a 12 year old girl to drive his patrol cruiser on the highway and um it says that in the report he admitted to an internal affairs investigator that he allowed both the 12 year old girl and his ex-spouse to drive the cruiser while an independent witness confirmed seeing the child driving the patrol unit on the highway while the officer's brother rode in the passenger seat of the marked vehicle which means they're on 16 um so, you know, is that not just the most super troopers thing you've read? Yes, I think I mean, it's not funny, <laughs> but it's really funny. No, it's and hilarious because like it sounds like he let his 12 year old drive his George State Patrol cruiser, which is next level stupid. But um, regardless, you know, I, I don't think that that means that he um, is guilty by any means i don't i don't know the context but i think it means that he has in the past exercised poor judgment um yeah one thing doesn't doesn't directly relate to the other but it certainly goes to his arrogance and uh his belief that that he's a he's above the law well and it's interesting that you bring up the arrogance factor because in the other allegation that was in that file it was like i said it was about an altercation um Where like there were threats to to punch and strike in the face and enforce the law against him and and stuff like that. So again, like not indicative of guilty of sexual battery, which is a misdemeanor, by the way. Like it just sounds so awful to be a misdemeanor. Like the terms are just yeah. And I hate to be I hate to be a person uh, that really gets lost in the minutia of vernacular, but yeah, sexual battery. I mean, battery sounds bad. Yeah. I mean, that's that's it sounds like you've left you've inflicted pain and like physical pain. And, you know, I'm not going to minimize what anyone goes through when they are an accuser or an alleged victim or an actual victim, well, whatever. And, but and, and, it, and we have the, we have a difference between yeah being pinned in a corner and groped and you get away. Yeah, that's certainly batter battery. You know, you're, gr- you know, you're pinned in a corner and like I said, trying to slide into second base, getting called out and, and someone going, you know what, that's, 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 that's battery. But, yeah. but anyway, as we said, we got, we got a lot of BS to get to this week. So we have the police officer in Southwest Georgia arrested for selling marijuana while on duty and in his uniform. Yeah. <laughs> Another story I love. (laughs) So, Leon Mitchell, 32 years old, worked for the Warwick Police Department, which is for Dion. Yeah, yeah, which is um, in uh, Worth County, like down by Lee County, um, Tifton, like kind of, I guess, a little bit west of Tifton, if anyone is familiar with Southwest Georgia. But um, yeah, so the the story is that the GBI's Southwestern Regional Drug Enforcement Office, which is like we have one in the Southeast Georgia. There's like 39 counties. I don't know how many it is in Southwest, but it's 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 dozens of counties, and they do lots of undercover, controlled by all that stuff. And so they received some information that um, this police officer was selling drugs in his uniform and possibly while on duty. So they started investigating it and on two different, at least two different occasions, one in Worth County and one in Lee County, they bought 
weed from Mitchell and subsequently went to the police department to arrest him. Um, And at the time, they searched the vehicle he was driving, and bless his heart, he had more marijuana in there, scales and plastic bags in the car um, on the police department property. So obviously they arrested him for a a ton of counts. The only one I don't agree with. So they arrested him for two counts of sale and distribution of marijuana, one count with intent to distribute, four counts of possession of a firearm during the felony, three counts of violation of oath, and two counts of communication device during the commission of a felony. I mean, well, I say there's two. There's two things I don't agree with. I think the thing about the communication device, they do that so the feds can come in and take the case. That's that's why they do that. Because once a cell phone's involved, then the federal jurisdiction applies and it's just nonsense. Said I wasn't going to cuss because Eric has to edit this on short notice. But it's it's ridiculous. The other one is that four counts of possession of a firearm during commission of a felony. I mean, it's because he had his gun on his hip that that's stupid he's not taking his gun out of his car or and getting and holding it in someone's face and saying give me the money buddy yeah yeah this isn't a robbery no yeah this this is this is part of his uniform now look this guy's a moron yeah he should have the book thrown at him yeah but this is no over this is overcharging a position of a firearm during a commission of a four felony. counts really he's that's always five in position years. of a firearm that's like, five years on a sentence I think. That's, yeah, 20. I think. If, and, if, and if, he'll plead, but unless the feds this, come this, in. This is why they, they do this, is they want to force a plea. It took, like I said, use of a communication uh, device during the commission. Who in the hell doesn't have a cell phone on them? Exactly. You know what? They could also get him the same thing for using his radio. If if a call came in and he said he's, you know, 10, 100 or whatever, <laughs> you know, uh if he used that's a communication device that that is asinine and that they're just they're overcharging to to force him to take a plea and that's most likely what he'll do uh, which i'm okay with he, that i just don't want him to be charged federally right well i mean that really would be petty to have the feds come in on a pot charge but they do look this it should be a firing offense it was weed. It's, I mean, he's, he's not he's not selling meth. It's weed. And it's, he should lose he, his post certification for doing oh, absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, he and, totally like he's 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 not in the clear. But I'm with you. Like this isn't some this is <laughs> this isn't, this isn't like, a kingpin. He's not no. influence peddling. He's not going out as an enforcer for a, a, lo- a local cartel or anything like that. This is a small town dipstick who was trying to make a little extra cash slinging, slinging some weed. Ask He's me an, what the population of Warwick, Georgia is. What is Dion's population? Leon. Dion Warwick. Leon is his name. Dion is a performer. I said his name for Dion. Okay. Dion uh, Warwick was, is an R&B singer. Okay, well, it's 400, 423 people. <laughs> Four, so he could have sold weed to all of them. <laughs> He's got the whole town hooked up. Like you have more people on your Facebook than the entire population of Warwick. Yeah, bless his heart. He was probably just trying to, you know, make some money. It the well, town is, yeah. is is a total area of 0.8 square miles. And you figure his salary is what, 22,000 a year? 215 households, 132 families. Wow. As of the 2020 census. So, I mean. And now their weed hookup. Is gone. Is in jail. Now where I are they going to get the weed? <laughs> I know. Now now the entire town is in a weed drought. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Listen to this. It says the per capita income for the city. Okay. Wow. Hold on. The median income for the household for the city is 30208 the median income for a family is thirty-seven thousand. Men's medium income is twenty-six two. Females fourteen one. The per capita Ooh. income for the city is twelve seven. About eighteen point five percent of families and twenty-seven percent of the population were below the poverty line. Wow. Yeah. But they are known for their National Grits Festival, which began in nineteen ninety-nine and took a four-year hiatus. 
that ended in 2017. At that time, Mayor Juanita Kinchin restarted the physical or the festival, and um, they enjoyed approximately 3,000 attendees. So, no grits, no weed. Yeah, no grits, no weed. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, wow. Listen to this. The Grits Festival. Okay, someone needs to go look at these people. The Grits Festival Committee helped fund the expansion of electricity to another portion of the city square and doubled the size of the festival in 2018. They 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 had a Grits Festival to, to bring electric power to the city square. I... This uh, this sounds a lot like I don't know nineteen thirty four field trip. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do a live show from <laughs> Warwick. <laughs> yeah, we can sit, hang out the windows, and Eric can video us. You're gonna have to bring your own weed, though. The, the supplier's gone. I know. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> they're the closest place they can get weed now is Albany. But it really does take some major league huevos to uh, to go in your cruiser in your uniform and like purchase weed, then get sit out, in, yeah, in the police owned vehicle with your scales weighing out dime and quarter bags and drive around with it, like yeah. I, this guy is either the dumbest human being on earth or. Just the has the biggest set on them. Just that is <laughs> I, again. <laughs> so these these stories these are the stories that I love because it just it it dumbfounds you. Well, this is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions and not those of anyone not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other episodes and relevant stories over the georgiavirtue.com. Mm-hmm. The past week in Georgia legislature, other than David, David Clark's dumbass. Yeah. So we heard about the official, I think, I can't remember if we talked about on the show because everything just blurs together. But I think we talked about the a parental bill of rights coming down the pipeline, right? Because I think I ranted about how cops have their own bill of rights. Victims have a bill of rights. Yeah, people, we, we don't, as, think, as a matter of, of, of point, we don't like the term bill of rights. No, I don't. So we did talk about uh, it on the show. Right. Yeah. The, the term Bill of Rights is, is a is a term they use to cram uh, legislation through just like putting somebody's name on something. Like, how can you say no to Jessica's bill? Yeah, uh, you, be- you better because Jessica doesn't want a bill named after Jessica. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but that's exactly what they do is they'll put a name on a bill or they put Bill of Rights on it to to push it through. And I've seen several different versions of, of different legislators uh idea of what the parents bill of rights should look like but the one that's on the floor now the one that the governor is pushing is is what is what we're talking about now right and he had mentioned that you know that was something that was going to be important to him and so this is being carried by senator clint dixon and then um josh bonner both of them are floor leaders josh bonner's in the house and so um Supposedly, like the the idea is to add transparency provisions to state law, guaranteeing parents the right to access instructional material. And it's by this organization called Transparency, but it has a T like parent. Ha! Ah, wow. So clever. Um, and and so, that could really be that could really be turned transparency could, could really be mean something different if we were in California. Sure. Absolutely. But thank goodness we're not. And so. This would say principals or superintendents, um, whenever they're sought by a parent to give information on the curriculum, they would have three days to provide it and um, like kind of like an open records request. And if the principal or superintendent is unable to share the information within that time period, they must provide the parent a written description of the material and a timeline for its delivery not to exceed 30 days. So literally... It's the Open Records Request or the Open Records Act in Georgia under the name Parents Bill of Rights. I mean, you could just go to this, right? You can go to the Board of Education right now and say, I would like, you know, the sixth grade curriculum on in English. 
And they have to give it to you already within three days. And if they can't, they have to tell you when they will. Yeah. So th- this is this is already public information. One of the versions of the bill that I saw that I thought was interesting was uh, the mediation with uh, uh, IEPs, I think is what they are, individual education plans. Mm-hmm. And this is for students that need extra help. Right. And one of the stories that I heard was actually out of Cobb County. Uh, a parent that was living like in East Cobb or West Cobb, you know, northern area of the county had a child that had an IEP. And I think, I think that's what it is. I, I, I don't have kids in school. Uh, I'm not a teacher, obviously. It's an IE plan, IEP plan. Okay, IEP plan. So, but they said, hey, we're going to send your little girl kindergartner to this this uh, school down in South Cobb. That's going to best be able to meet her needs. This particular school is where they send all the reprobates. All the kids that were kicked out of school for whatever reason, fighting, weapons, gang activity, get sent to this one school. And we're going to send your daughter there because uh, they can best meet her needs. And he's like, no, no, no. No, you're not. Uh, she's coming back to this school and you're going to continue to meet her needs uh, uh, under our plan. And the school at this time, the school had the ultimate, the, the district had the ultimate decision on that. And this idea was to have an independent mediator come in and, and do that. You could protest as a parent, but you didn't have the right to tell them, you know, you will treat, you will uh, teach my child at, the, at this location. Well, he showed up with his daughter at the school and the principal met him at the door, like something out of uh, 1960s Alabama after right. Brown v. Education, and blocked the door and said, you are not bringing her in here. Which and is ridiculous. Yeah, and your only choice is get a lawyer. So but, one of the plans that I saw that was from Anna Votarde originally was to to address that as well as the educational materials. Mm-hmm. And I don't see that in this plan. Well, because, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you legislate what you just said? I don't know. Neither do they, which is why it's not in there. Yeah, right. Um, And, you know, no offense to your senator, but he has a a, a habit of just talking about addressing stuff that because he wants his constituency to feel heard, but he doesn't really have any authority or 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 truthfully like any real consistent mechanism for remedying. Yeah, as as a as a freshman senator. Um. I, and and I and like I said I don't know exactly how, how how to word it. I mean I'm sure there's there's a there's an attorney out there or a lobbyist out there that that could draw that up into words. But that's but that's what happens. These bills are drawn by lobbyists, and the group that you just mentioned, the transparency, is a lobbyist group. Well, that and prepare these pieces of legislation, and exactly hand right. it to legislators. That's exactly right, and you know they, um, you know. It blows my mind. They, this all came because of what happened in Virginia, right? With the comment by um, McAuliffe saying, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. And then there was a bill in Florida that kind of mimicked what Georgia's trying to do. But if you go to this transparency, Georgia.com, again with the T, there is a tab on John Carson, the one of the reps who's carrying the bill, like it's home education, transparency, healthcare articles, John Carson, which to me is a huge flag. Like why, why first, why that that's really it. Why? Yeah, I. Why is a lawmaker on a lobbyist website? And well, yeah, exactly. And honestly. He would be better served if they did not do that. If they did not directly tie themselves, this happens all the time. This happens with with the the porn bill that came down. It was written by well a nutcase lobbyist, and is, is shopped out to various states' legislatures. Well, in this Your group, buddy. this group, so kind of speaking to what you were talking about. In, in a broader sense, their advocacy as a whole is that parents have the right to direct the education and health care of their minor children. They have the right um, on moral and religious training. They have the right to enroll the children in the school of their choice, whether it be public, private, religious, home study, or any other option. They have the right to- do we already all- have that right? Yeah. 
We have the, they have the right to access all school records. They have the right to receive communication from the school, to be notified of violent activity, um, to be notified if state and local government suspects a criminal offense has been committed against a minor child, and to cons- they have the right to consent in writing before a video, audio, or photo is taken of a minor child. Um, again, I'm pretty sure all these things are already... Well, and yeah, I, have I, I say that as a person who's not a huge proponent or defender of public schools. Look, I have a cure for this. I do. I, very simple. Uh, the background on it, I've got a friend that lives in Cobb County. I was at his house. And uh, he lives in a very nice area of East Cobb. And this was during the, the height of the pandemic when a lot of kids were doing homeschool. Uh, he was walking by his daughter, his high school daughter's, uh, class and the teacher was talking essentially critical race theory. And when he gets done, he asks her, says, sweetie, what class was that? She said algebra. So all the legislation in the world is not going to cure that. Mm-hmm. If a teacher decides to go off book, it's not in the lesson plan. The lesson plan was uh, two times X minus Y equals Z. That's algebra. Not critical race theory, but the teacher decided to use that platform to warp young minds because the teacher had had an agenda. And had he not been walking by, he never would have heard it. My cure to this is put cameras and microphones on every uh, in every class. We already have the technology. We've been using it for two years during the pandemic. For two years, we have the, we've had the technology for teachers to be on camera and on. Every parent, every taxpayer should have access to what every teacher is teaching. You should be able to pull up any classroom in the state of Georgia and see what teachers are talking about. And parents should be able to reference that and go and see, okay, it's two o'clock. She's in history class. Let me see what they're, what they're covering today and pop in and watch it. Same thing oh as when, God. when I was in school, parents could come and sit in the classroom and observe. But I don't want to micromanage. Like if, if you're that concerned, again, if you are that worried about what your child is being taught or that you can't, re- like you can't override it, at home with your own objectives and your own ideologies, then just homeschool them. Like it's not, it's not about that. It's about holding, holding our employees accountable. They are not our employees. School systems are answer and the school boards of education, they answer to the governor, not the people of Georgia. That is what the state constitution says. We created it that way. Yeah, but we pay them. The, well, se- what is it? Seventy percent of of my yeah. taxes on on the house go to the school system, and I have beyond parents' uh, bill of rights. This needs to be written taxpayers. You know, taxpayers. Any taxpayer should be able to get these records. I mean, I just, I just don't know what that's going to accomplish because, I mean, because it, it's it's just going to end up like then you're going to end up dealing with teachers explaining things that you don't like the way that they explained it or you don't like how they discipline like, it's just it's going to be constant when you i'm not saying that when you just hand your kid over you should just turn a blind eye and say you know i'll see you at three o'clock and we'll deal with whatever comes of it it's not that it's that that you do have to make concessions that nobody is going to raise your child exactly like you are and if you're going to hand your kid over you've got to like and, and my other, my thing, too, is like these most of the time, 99 percent of the time that someone is angry about something that's being taught, they're mad after it's already been taught. They didn't read through the syllabus. They didn't go to any education meetings along the way. They didn't ask at the beginning of the school year. It's after it's already happened. And then they're outraged. Like, why should we have to as taxpayers have to take more steps and more um, put forth more resources to monitor something that parents aren't taking the initiative on in the first place. Well, we, but it's not, we already have the stuff to do it because we've been doing it for two years. It's that it's the same idea. If you leave a wallet full of cash on the sidewalk, people will walk by it and not pick it up because there's an assumption that assumption that they're, they're being watched. It's, it's, you know, when, when your boss is, is in the room, you behave differently. And, you know, they are they are state employees. If, if you don't want to be monitored, don't be a teacher. It, it, like I said, you shouldn't be discussing CRT in math class. 
It is not, that's not going to be on the syllabus. It's not going to be on the lesson plan. It's sure as hell not in the books. But why is this, why is this teacher getting you, into that did in a you, math class? Did you ever have teachers talk about subject matter that was not related to? Oh, I'm sure. Right. So how are you going to, dis- are you going to say you just can't talk about critical race theory? Because I know lots of teachers who spent lots of time getting off in the weeds on topics that weren't related to whatever the course they were teaching. Like, you're going to discipline them too? We had teachers like I knew uh, my one of my English teachers was a, a big lefty. And she she was a, a sweetheart. She, but she never let politics get into it. I was, I happened to know her, uh, a, a, you know, some way else. Knew that she was a big time feminist and lefty and all that stuff. I actually took a wrong answer on, on a test one day, which was was the first feminist book, and I answered the feminist manifesto. And I purposely mm. took a wrong answer just just to needle her. But she kept politics out of the classroom. I knew, I knew what her politics were, but she, she, she would get off, get off on, get off on subjects of personal stuff, or you know, asking the kids how their weekend was. But she, she left politics out of it. And this is remember, I was in high school at the time when uh, the Clintons were coming into power. The uh, uh, during my senior year, Bob Dole was was running against Clinton. Actually, it was before uh, a little after my senior year, but. Uh, that's the, that's the time that I was in high school. So there was a there was a hyper uh, political charged environment, but most of the teachers stayed the heck out of it. Well, and it I'm be just the, the school district I was in also was highly conservative, and she wanted to keep her job. I am just I am adamantly opposed. I don't think that the general public has the ability to look at this objectively and think critically about the intricacies of what goes into a day of, of teaching kids and, and to be proactive and everything. Because like I said, I mean, it was like we were talking about before we started with my post about Maude Arbery's mom and her influence on the system. People can't see past their own emotion. And the last thing we need is more emotion governing public schools, like for the love of Pete, enough. Well, this is true. The, the, the average person has a, a general inability to remove emotion from any conversation. So moving on, because we uh, belingered that a little too long, all things law enforcement. The Senate, Senate Finance Committee gave approval to SB 361, the proposal to allow tax breaks for local police department donations. Freaking Jeff Duncan can't get out of there fast enough. I'll tell you what. I cannot wait for January 1, 2023. Like, I am so sick of his crap. He, this it's time, is his, it's like, time to make a call to the bullpen. Uh, yeah, this is ridiculous. Like... He is trying to mimic what he did with the rural hospitals, which wasn't really, I mean, what he did with the real hospitals was totally self-interested because at the time he worked for a healthcare executive. Um, and so whatever. But this time he wants to make these these credits you can give to law enforcement foundations. They'll be able to use the money for training and equipment and pay raises. So basically like an entity, like a police department or um, a county of agencies with the sheriff's office, the police and everything would come up. They would organize a law enforcement foundation and then you could donate to the foundation. And the foundation would distribute money to the the agencies as a pass through, which is just a total recipe for disaster. Um, and it would they'd be allowed to take like collectively as a state, they'd be um, allowed to give up to one hundred million dollars in tax credits, five thousand dollars per person. Um, $5 million per foundation each year. I just am just ha- absolutely hell no. And this is part of this bill is the one where they want to send the social workers to calls with the mentally ill, which just paints all the problems. Like, I mean, how are you, are you going to call it someone's mentally ill? Are you going to have some a social worker riding around for you? Are they going to be on call? Are they going to be um, like riding around in their own car so they can just drive around different areas what if and you don't have week, one we just said we have a shortage of mental health professionals in the state of georgia so much so that they want a grant program to train more of them yeah i mean it's just complete and utter dumbassery hey look i feel for for the the those with mental health issues i, I really do and i i want there to be a resolution to it where we don't have uh 
that, that we don't have the problems with mental health. If I could take a magic wand, I, I really would. I, I'd wave it and, and and cure these people. I have a real soft spot in my heart. Uh, you know, a lot of guys I know struggle with with depression and, and some other stuff. And yeah, it would be wonderful if you had a psychologist in your pocket that you could pull out and, and throw at him and go, okay, uh, instant couch, lay down here and let's talk about why you're feeling depressed. But I don't, I don't see how it's practical, especially if it's a situation that's coming to a head. You're going to make a phone call to somebody who may be in session with somebody and say, okay, well, when that hour's up, uh, I've got I've got 30 minutes before my next session comes in. Let me run over and address this guy's suicidal thoughts before I go back to my office and handle somebody somebody's uh, marriage counseling. Right. And somebody in a in like a smaller town, like even where I am, I mean, we have a fairly large sheriff's office. Stageboro Police Department is sizable, as is the Georgia Southern Police Department. Um, by and large, like. They cannot afford to, they can, they're not even fully staffed with the officers they need for the shifts. I don't think they can employ a medical professional to be available. And even, and then, and you can never just have one because one person can't be on call seven days a week. Well, they, well, they could probably handle Warwick. Maybe all 134 all, households. Well, I mean, it is. not really. You're telling me that one person can handle all 504 people who had their weed supply cut off, really? Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those people are going to be are going to be really edgy and depressed. <laughs> What's your medical condition? I get really bummed when I'm out of weed. <laughs> yeah, my cop's in jail. My, my cop's in jail. <laughs> you know, the only thing that it, it's reminiscent of for me is the old, I'll make a donation to the police, policeman's ball. You know, as a way of, of getting yourself out of trouble that, you know, big time don- uh, donors to to this will feel like they have a special consideration. And I, and I don't and, and that may not be the fact, but it's certainly if somebody who's made a large donation ends up not getting arrested for something or is found not guilty or has tr- charges dropped or gets a, uh, a plea deal that people don't like, that's the first thing they're going to point to. Well, and it's interesting because with the real hospital tax credit, a lot of the donations um, were not public, like, because even if the the rural hospital received money from the county or the city or whatever, um, they weren't 100% public or they weren't uh, run by a hospital authority or something. This is a totally different ballgame. So all that information will be public. Um, right. Eh. Now we have all things super self-serving. Senate Bill 330, John Albers. Mm-hmm. Giving the gift of life act, because why would we make this uh, not a heartstring bill with a lot of emotion behind it? So John Albers and his son recently... Um, I don't, I think Alberts gave his son a kidney. I think, I can't recall, but his, his son is an adult um, and he needed a kidney and he, he, John Alberts, Senator Alberts was a match. So it was successful. Um, I want to say it was right before the holidays. So we come back for session and Alberts files a bill to prohibit insurance companies from canceling or refusing to write health insurance policies um, because a person is either the applicant or on a list for a donor or wants to be the person who gives a don um, gives a an organ. However, it's only for kidneys and livers. Anything else you want to donate, your insurance company can can you. John Alberts doesn't give a. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. What else can you donate and stay alive? Can't you give like parts of your spleen and stuff? Maybe, maybe. Uh, and I feel like, but yeah, this is given. Um, first of all, if you're on a health, uh, individual health care plan, this is this does not apply at all to people on group plans. Group plans, it stays. You're at a high. You're in a, a large number risk pool. It only applies to to individual plans. But what you're doing is you're telling an insurance company that they have to lose money. They yes. have to lose money on somebody. You 
this is when I t- when I when I tell people you know pre-existing conditions and they pull the heartstrings. That's like taking your brand new car, crashing it into a wall, then getting on the phone with the gecko and say, "Hey, I need to insure my car," and then saying, "Okay, you got to fix it now." It's it's a, I know it's a it's a heartless thing to say, but insurance companies are in business to make money. And I and I despise insurance companies. A lot of them. Uh, I told you last week that I that, that I that I listen to the conversations that that these patients have to have with uh, with the folks at my physical therapy and stuff. Uh, I feel for them. But the insurance company has to stay in business so they can provide insurance for everybody else. When they lose money on, let's say, fifty patients that that are that are donors are on the donor list or received whatever it is, when they lose tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of dollars on those policies and they're forced to keep those policies in place, they have to charge more to everybody else. And that's when you get everybody else screaming, why are my premiums going up? Why are my premiums going up? I hardly use it. No, the, the other guy that has the same insurance company uh, is on the donor list and we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get him, to get him taken care of. So we have to spread that cost out to everybody else. Because that's just the way your legislature is. said we had to. Right. That's what's so messed up about it. I mean... Look, it's economics 101. If you if you put the insurance company out of business, say you can't raise premiums and you have to cover everything, no one's covered for anything. No, and, and the, but the thing is, here's the thing, you said what other thing can you give or, you know, and stay alive? That's not what it's about because it's not about just the exchange. Like if if it's if also I, the recipient. Yeah, it's everybody. So like if I need a lung, I'm my insurance can cancel me, but if you need a kidney, they can't cancel you. That's not right either. You're right. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I thought about it from the donor side, not from the recipient side. You're right. Heart transplant, lung transplant. Uh, so all those people can get can get canceled. But if you take a kidney, oh man, yeah, I can't touch. I can't. But which, wait, which would lead me to believe they're more likely to cancel the lobectomies and the the heart transplants and mm-hmm. uh, cancel those folks because they have to cover liver and kidneys. Right. Even if they were going to otherwise, or if it was more, you know, if they like, they have to as weigh a, the cost benefit. But there's more. And as a drinker, I should support this. Well, of course. <laughs> but the bill is goes beyond that and, and talks about the state income tax for donors and gives credits to come um, to people. And it does so retroactively um, to give the tax credit for um, to for, himself, mm-hmm. to himself. And, and, he and dropped it also a bill gives, to retroactively give himself a tax credit for donating. And then it the, um, the, the, the there's also a tax credit for companies that. Like if you, if Dr. Cool has an employee who donates a kidney and you give your employee like $300 a day while they're recovering from their donation surgery, you get a tax credit. Right. Yeah. It it, passed 51 to zero. Yeah, it did. Because he was able to look everybody in the eye that he works with 40, 40 legislative days a year, you know, 90 days a year, and look him in the eye and go, this is what happened to me. And they're all like, ah, damn it. Well, you know, all right. well, yes, he, he was the first campaign I ever worked on. I don't know if we've talked about it on the show, but he is Senator Albers is why I write for a living because of his I got I helped get him elected. And then I saw what he did, and that's why I started writing. That's the kind of person he is. He's my mom's state senator in Alpharetta. And do you know why my mom is a better parent than Senator Albers? Because she wouldn't care what her insurance said. If she needed to give me a kidney, she would just cut it out and give it to me and do what she had to do instead of, like, filing a bill and then wanting to get a tax credit for it. Kim probably would put herself in an ice bath and cut her own kidney out and say, okay, now take care of it. Yeah, but I don't wouldn't want hers because she has kidney stones, too. <laughs> okay, clear the stones out before you give it to me. Yeah. Jessica, as we're uh, in danger of running long, how about your closing thought? Uh, higher education hits another new low. Um, there's an, a course now. It's one of those, like, I don't know what you call it. I guess it's like a mini mister. Um, but at NYU, you can take a course on the appeal and aversions of becoming Taylor Swift. <laughs> On becoming Taylor Swift. And we wonder why kids come out of college and don't know anything about anything and and are useless to the workforce. It's because they spent... All I know is don't date her or you have a song written about you. Ten months. Like, or ten weeks, excuse me, learning about 
what it's like to be Taylor Swift. Like, who cares? Look, if this was at a Juilliard or something like that, and and you want to look at, you know, the composition of a pop song and what it takes. Okay, great. NYU is a legitimate, used to be, legitimate institution of higher learning. And it really cheapens it. And look, kids are taking student loans to pay for tuition at NYU and pay to live in New York City with the astronomical rents. Go take a 10-week course on Taylor Swift? Good Lord, man. That's a good one, Jess. Thanks. It's a good one. Way to, way to end with outrage. <laughs> All right. I got a dealer's choice for you. Do you want the buffet brawl or the candidate warning poster? Candidate warning poster. All right, so we've talked about Neil Wollen before. He is running for HD 17 against Martin Mumptahan. This is the guy that that came out just with some racist stuff, calling, uh, implying that Martin was a Muslim, which he's Martin is Southern as collard greens. His mom is from Alabama. His father is a <laughs> is a Christian who fled Iran from when uh, the Ayatollah took over in the 70s. Like the worst he was thing born you could. In, the worst narrative you could have against this guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely the worst narrative. Uh, first time I, one of the first times I met Martin, we were at a, uh, we were at a Shepherd's Rest uh, dinner, and uh, he was loading up his plate with barbecue. And he goes, "Hey man, <laughs> take a picture of me with this pork." They all say I'm a Muslim. <laughs> but Neil Wollen come, comes out with some racist stuff. So, so some. Research was done into Wolin's background. Like, he has charges for beating a grandmother, weed charges. This guy's only like 24, 25 years old. He's young, uh, just a just an absolute jackass. Moved into district to run against Martin and wants to be a member of the Freedom Caucus. So let's tie that back into the first story. Mm. This this is what the Freedom Caucus is is attracting. Our, our guys that, that have... No common sense and no no real leadership ability and no ability to make anything happen. They just want to stomp their feet and make it happen. So he so a flyer goes out to HD 17. It's a warning flyer with his arrest record on there. It said, be careful. This person knocks on your door. <laughs> it's terrible. It is terrible. It's, it's, it's awful. But what this is, is it's just it's crushing the guy. Is making sure that you know if 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 you come in here slinging stuff like that, we're gonna you know the the community's gonna crush you. You want to come in and, and hit Marty on on issues? Go for it. That's a debate that the people of of District Seventeen deserve to have. Is let's get down to the issues of who believes in what. What bills did Martin vote for that you would have voted against, and vice versa. What bills would you drop and what do you want to do versus what the incumbent's doing? Those are conversations to have. And and like you mentioned before, I don't know that the electorate has the bandwidth to understand substantive debate. They want to get into, he's a Muslim, he's a racist. And it's the same thing that happened with the uh, Anavatarde race with, uh, with, uh, um, with Boyd Austin, it got really, really ugly with the implication that Jason wasn't a citizen and 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 things like that when he's... His family is from Puerto Rico, and his father uh, was a Vietnam vet, a decorated Vietnam vet. And, uh, and, got, and got that race just left the rails because it stopped being about substance and got into uh, name calling. So this, this race is, is – this primary is, is going to heat up, obviously, once uh, session gets out and – and once qualifying happens, and they can really start throwing haymakers at each other. But I, Wolin is just a little smarmy turd. I, I watched his response video, and I laughed at it. I'm now banned from his campaign page. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even make a comment. I just laughed at it. Next thing I know, I can't even pull it up. Gone. <laughs> Thin-skinned little bee. <laughs> so, Eric Cumbie, our editor, welcome back from vacation. Uh, he uh, uh, has been laying in the sun, getting getting tan, doing all things not editing our show for a week, which is awesome. If we all need to get away, so welcome back, Eric, our awesome editor for Jerks, Eric, <laughs> Jessica Solaji, Eric. Yeah, I just I just made you a benefer, Jerick, <laughs> for Eric Solaji. Oh my God! <laughs> for, ah, I know for Jessica Solaji, <laughs> the partner in this in this endeavor, uh, whose words I. Totally mangle every time she types types things up for me. I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. Oh, I've been running from the law. Hope they won't shoot me down soon. They sing on a sleepless night. Try to catch me.
me howling at the moon.